the devil awakens. Maximus wrests his life from the underworld. Hey boy, what in the world are you doing here? He was elated with his escape. I want it out. I set out now in a box upon the sea. So um, let me just read you a, a, an example of how effective the government was in um, trying to eliminate the ability to, um, to really regulate arsenic. Through a variety of secret measures, both uh, scientific and known facts about arsenic food residues and the dangers from lead arsenic, remained hidden from consumers by public officials in Congress, the FDA, the Department of Agriculture, and the universities. The effectiveness of the arsenic defense campaign mounted by the FDA, the Department of Agriculture, large-scale growers, and the chemical corporations depended on this closed-door policy. During the 1920s and 30s, the Department of Agriculture and the FDA actually conducted all of their meetings about and investigations into arsenic behind closed doors under a cloud of secrecy. This was a carefully managed effort to shield uh, from the American, the American public from the scientifically known and demonstrable health and safety risk associated with um, arsenic and lead residues. And these, um, this is a uh, discussion that was had between the um, uh, FDA and the Department of Agriculture officials at a meeting in St. Louis of the um, uh, Food and Drug Administration. And this is a Food and Drug Administration official. What do you think would happen if the general public became acquainted with the fact that apples were likely to be contaminated with arsenic? So far we have not given the matter any publicity and the public as a whole has no general knowledge on the subject. We, the FDA, will be in a more enviable position when all apples are satisfactorily clean to say to the public, if it gets curious, that the apples produced in this country can be eaten with perfect safety. If they were to become curious today, we would probably have to admit that we are perhaps not doing everything possible to remove excess arsenic from our fruit. But the public knew more than the FDA wanted to think they did as newspaper reports of poisoning illustrate, and you can see here, the public knew well what was going on, and they were the ones, because they were the ones that were being poisoned. And it was widespread. It wasn't like, it wasn't like rare. <coughs> At the same time that this whole arsenic struggle was going on in the United States, um, Standard Oil got a lucky break. Uh, Dr. Seuss, who was then Theodore Geisel and only called himself Seuss occasionally, um, was a well-respected cartoonist by that time. He was writing for the judge, and before that he was a cartoonist at Dartmouth College, because all the uh, major universities had papers at the time like Harvard Lampoon, right? And they all had a cartoonist on staff. He was the cartoonist in Dartmouth. And uh, so he was, you know, quite well known, and he put out these two cartoons in 1928 that used FLIT, which was a, a hand pump sprayer that would spray pesticides. And we had a little, you know, quart container on it, and then a bicycle pump sprayer on the top of it. And um, FLIT is what they, was, was one of the most popular bug sprays. And so these sprayers came to be called FLIT guns. And when I was a kid, the flit guns were, you know, what everybody used. My mom used to spray us with flit just when she was teasing, right? Or later on with DDT because the guy that sold DDT to us said, oh, it's safe, don't worry about it, you can spray it on anybody. So anyway, like uh, Dr. Seuss came along and for 15 years he worked for Standard Oil selling pesticides. And then after that he worked for the U.S. Army and popularized DDT as Captain Theodore Geisel. And um, so, in many ways, he was the most important pesticide salesman in history because he got people to feel comfortable with pesticides. Here, this, they're telling you gargle, flit. This is a petroleum phthalate, which is cancer-causing. All the phthalates are cancer-causing, right? And this is the 
you know, the same thing that's in plastic bottles that we're just trying to get rid of, right? This is another phthalate. And so here he is trying to make people feel comfortable about a pesticide, and people were less uncomfortable because, as you can see here, in spite of the Seuss campaign, which was designed to, you know, to get people comfortable with pesticides, people were getting killed. I mean, in 1933, a 15-year-old girl from Montana died from eating fruit with arsenic residues, and you can just go down this list. 1933, Los Angeles suffered one of the worst episodes of arsenic poison, cramps, vomiting, diarrhea, high fever, bloody urine, bloody stool, bloody vomit, cold sweats, irregular pulse, and exhaustion were common. Cabbage had 35 times the level allowed by the government, and the government already allowed too much. <laughs> Pears had 54 times the limit, and this was common, I mean, because nobody was regulating, nobody was watching the store. Then in the early 1930s, the Consumers Union uh, was created, and this became, after uh, Upton Sinclair, one of the most important food activist organizations, and still is, still is. I mean, we depend on Consumers Union, Consumers Report, and Consumers Research for an enormous amount of data on the food system today. And these were the early, the second stage muckrakers after Upton Sinclair. And one of their first books was 100 Million Guinea Pigs, which was, you know, chapters in that were about food and about arsenic, about lead. And then the second book was Eat, Drink, and Be Wary. And the third book was 40 Million Guinea Pig Children. And the idea was is that they didn't ever test these chemicals. They didn't ever test these fertilizers. They just put them on the market and we became the guinea pigs. And the same is true today. I mean, with genetically modified food, nobody's tested this stuff. You know, nobody has analyzed these pesticides in any significant way and eliminated ones that are dangerous to us. So all of these books that were put out by the Consumers Union had um, large sections devoted to pesticides and uh, dangerous fertilizers. And then after the war, um, uh, and during the war, the government uh, increased our nitrogen capability for producing synthetic nitrogen, mostly for bomb material, but also for uh, nitrogen to grow food <laughs> as a fertilizer. Because um, you can use it for the same thing. You can make bombs out of it or you can make fertilizer out of it, which kind of tells you <laughs> something is wrong with this picture. And um, what it does to the soil is it makes it as hard as a rock and then you have to use a lot more heavy equipment to work it. So, but anyway, after the Second World War, most of the farmers thought that the synthetic nitrogen plants would be given to farmer co-ops. But all of those synthetic nitrogen plants were given to chemical companies. Corporations uh, like DuPont and Monsanto and Lion uh, and so forth. And um, after the Second World War, they conducted an enormous advertising blitz. Before the war, only 5% of the fertilizer that was used on farms was synthetic fertilizer. By 1960, over 50% was synthetic fertilizer. And by 1990, 90% um, you know, was synthetic fertilizer. And today, it's Close to 95% is synthetic fertilizer. The only breakthroughs are on organic farms where people can't use synthetic fertilizers. And then the other war toys, um, after the war, anti-personnel weapons were sold to farmers as pesticides. DDT was an anti-personnel weapon and a controller of typhus and malaria during the Second World War. And its relatives, talone, which is 1,3-dichloropropene, is you know, one of the most toxic chemicals and is the most used fungicide on the planet. 2,4-D which is, and 2,4-5-T, which were two of the main ingredients in Agent Orange that we used in Vietnam. Um, Endrin, Deldrin, Toxaphene, all of those are, are um, you know, phenolized, uh, you know, chlorinated hydrocarbons. They're just incredibly toxic. And um, many of them, Talone, 2,4-D, and Atrazine, are still widely used. And then uh, by the early 50s, late 40s and early 50s, they started introducing parathion and 7, which were parathion as an organophosphate and 7 as a carbamate, and they're both nerve poisons. 
And those were nerve poisons that they used during the war. That, it's the same nerve, basic family of nerve poison that they used in that Japanese um, chemical attack uh, with sarin. Sarin was the um, material that they used. So these chemicals are like, you know, they're war chemicals one day and pesticides the next. And then the next thing they added after the Second World War was hormones and antibiotics. And they found out that the antibiotics, especially um, if they fed them to animals in confined spaces, that they, one, were prophylactic in terms of disease. They didn't get as sick as they got previously. And they found out that they got incremental weight gain from the antibiotics, right? So that meant that they could finish the animals faster. You'd have to use less feed. And of course, this was all attractive to the farmers because, you know, we're going to be able to produce these animals for less money and get them out faster. But this totally changed the way animals were managed. And like in uh, 1995, 74% of the pigs were raised on outside of confinement operations, either in sheds or outside. So they always had access to the outside. Now pigs don't have any access to the outside. And 95% are raised in confinement operation in um, bacon bins or hog hotels, they call them, where there'd be tens of thousands of hogs in one place. You can't hear yourself in the places. And so as a result, farmers, livestock, and consumers have developed antibiotic resistance. The antibiotics we use in this country, 80% are used on animals, 20% on us. 80%. And they're the same antibiotics. Hello? Will we, will we get any resistance from this? Oh, probably not. And everybody's worried about hormones. We're using all these hormones in animals. We're worried about hormones with athletes. Hello? <laughs> you got all these hormones in you because you're eating all this stuff. You're drinking all this stuff with hormones in it, right? So you're getting incremental doses of those hormones all the time. So we wonder why we've gotten so fat all of a sudden. You know, we got, wait a minute, we're eating foods that we've never eaten before in four million years. You know, I mean, these are foods that are completely new to us. So then, I mean, everybody thinks that Silent Spring started before all this stuff, but Silent Spring was response to an enormous amount of this stuff. And like, if you read Silent Spring, you realize that Rachel Carson knew about this time depth with pesticides and fertilizers. She talks about arsenic in Silent Spring. And she criticizes arsenic before she ever gets to DDT. You know, because it's such an old pesticide that was used and damaged so much. Um, so, in response to Rachel Carson, I mean, we really had, you know, probably our first breakthroughs in terms of getting rid of some of these chemicals. Because of Rachel Carson, by the early 70s, we were done with DDT in this country. Lost its regulation. Can't be regulated in any areas of the world that have those relationships with the United States except for about 10 countries that don't have the relationships and for special things like they're still trying to license it for malaria but the story is is that it only lasts for a little while I remember when they first bought DDT onto our farm like this guy Harold that was a um, worked in the feed store came to the farm and gave this classic you know can pitch that they had taught him about DDT and he opened the DDT in our house. This was in 46, early 47 maybe. And um, all the flies and mosquitoes in the house just, you know, started dying. I mean, they're just literally when he opened the bottle. Now we don't know whether he sprayed around with a flit gun or whatever beforehand because we hadn't anticipated it. But I mean, it was so dramatic that my folks bought some that day and they weren't like, chemical farmers. They didn't have arsenic in the house. They didn't have lead in the house. They didn't have um, black leaf 40, which was tobacco poison in the house. And they bought some that day and it was really effective. And my mom, we had a lot of flies because we had pigs and chickens and cows and goats and way too many flies. And so my job was swatting flies outside the door. And um, when we got DDT, I was, that was heaven. You know, I didn't have to swat any more flies. And that lasted for about a year and a half, maybe two years. And then the flies came back with a vengeance. So we mixed the DDT with chlordane first, because that's what they suggested. And uh, then we mixed it with lindane. 
And then we started using lindane alone, and pretty soon they didn't work at all, right? Because the flies developed resistance to it. They developed a tolerance to it. And so, you know, people stopped using DDT because it didn't work. It wasn't like, oh, we better save this chemical dog. It does not work anymore. You can save it all you want, but, you know, you're wasting your money. So, um, a lot of the chemicals that we lost because of Rachel Carson and Silent Spring and all the pesticide activism were replaced by organophosphates. The worst thing they could replace them with because they're nerve poisons. And they started replacing uh, some of those as they failed with fluorine and uh, synthetic nicotines. And now the most damaging pesticides to the bees are those fluorine nicotine compounds. That's what's killing a bulk of the bees. So uh, then, in the 1970s, the chemical industry and farm magazines began this major advertising campaign where they promised that um, genetically mani manipulated crops uh, would reduce pesticide use, would uh, be drought resistant, be naturally fertile, and cure hunger, right? Well, by the early 1900s, 1990s, I should say, I made a mistake on that. They genetically modified tomatoes, corn, cotton, soy, canola, and potatoes almost exclusively to risk or produce pesticides. Not to be naturally fertile, not, not to be naturally drought tolerant, but to be able to use more pesticides. These are pesticide sales companies. They didn't want to get rid of pesticides. They just wanted to find a way where they could extend their usage. And that's what they did with a lot of genetically modified crops. And today, 98% of canola, 96% of cotton, 80% of corn, and 96% of soy in the U.S. is genetically altered to tolerate more herbicides and make pesticides. And 80% of the processed food you eat has genetically modified ingredients in them. And at the end of the talk, we'll talk a little bit about why we need genetically modified crops labeled on our food shelves. Um, but that's a little bit later. So instead of Seuss's humor, the result of all these decades of chemical assault has left rural communities all over the world da damaged and dead, not laughing. And if any of you remember the, the Bhopal tragedy in 1984, you know, completely devastated the community of Bhopal. And like, um, in one night, 8,000 people died. And now, over 12,000 people have died from that. And 200,000 people were blinded. I mean, and some of them permanently. And so not only were people killed, they were, you know, their lives were devastated. And um, uh, Union Carbide, which owned the company at the time, and had the little bunny running around with the flashlight batteries, you know. Um, well, that company just walked out of India and refused to pay any uh, repatriations for the damage that they caused. And the community of India was forced to pick that up. So let me just give you a, an example of how toxic it is today. This is from 2005, but it's almost essentially the same today. These are the top six chemicals used in California agriculture. And you can see they use a lot. Um, sulfur is the most used, but they don't use very much per acre, only nine pounds for a whole acre. And an acre is like 209 by 209. So nine pounds over that isn't a tremendous amount. Oil, uh, which is really a dormant oil that they use on trees for the most part, um, they use about 11 pounds an acre. Again, it's not a uh, enormous, and it's not a, enormously toxic. Both of them can cause birth defects, but in high rates, not at relatively low rates like this. The third one is methamsodium, which is a carbamate. It's a nerve poison. And look at how much they use per acre on that, 104 pounds. 104 pounds, holy goodness. You know, that is a toxic puppy, that little piece of acreage that they use that on. And um, you can see how many acres they use it on a lot. And methyl bromide, 134 pounds an acre. And it is the most damaging chemical <coughs> atom for atom on the ozone because it potentiates with chlorofluorocarbons and damages the ozone. Plus, it also is a really potent greenhouse gas. 
And then the third one, the fifth one is 1,3-dichloropropane, which is telon 2, a really close relative of DDT, and they use 142 pounds of that per acre in California. And then chloropicrin is the sixth one, and chloropicrin is, does anybody know what that is? It's tear gas. <laughs> it's my favorite thing to have on food. <laughs> Every time I eat, I say, God, I got to get that tear gas taste. I mean, come on, they're using tear gas on all of our food, you know, it's like, hello, something is wrong with this picture. So this is for California strawberries, and um, you can see methamphetamine sodium is there, chloropicrin's there, 1,3-dichloropropene, and you see like uh, 335 pounds of pesticides per acre to do strawberries, so when you're having strawberries next year, do not get them from California, unless they say organic on them. I mean, honest to God, this is the most single toxic fruit. And we think it's like the queen fruit, right? Everybody wants strawberries for their dessert. Well, strawberries are not that safe if they're coming from a factory farm. And, um, you know, California is the only state that has data, so we can't say the same thing is happening in Florida, but they copy each other, I'll guarantee you that. Um, but you can see here, like, this is a, this is a serious issue. And then um, here's uh, watermelons. Well, they only use 73 pounds an acre. Well, that's a lot better than strawberries, but you can see it's the same chemicals, methyl bromide, chloropicrin, 1,3-dichloropropene, methamphetamine, sodium. Five of the most toxic pesticides count for almost 90% of all the pesticides used. I mean, they still use a lot of other pesticides, but my God, you know, five chemicals. And these are the most, some of the most toxic pesticides in the world. And then carrots, you know, everybody loves a nice carrot, but they use 108 pounds on carrots. And again, it's the same bad actors, chloropicrum, you know, 1,3-dichloropropene and methamphetamine sodium. 70% is a carbamate of nerve poison that kills literally everything, right, in the soil. So every year you have to, you know, revitalize that soil. So this is uh, one of my favorite cartoons because here's Popeye, you know, comes to the FDA and he's pissed off. You know, he wants some, you know, a little bit of flesh for all the damage the FDA is doing by not regulating, right? Um, and so they give him a can of toxic spinach. That's the end of him, you know, and so, and you can see it out here, like 200 million pounds of beef recalled since mid-2007, you know, and like just a year ago they had beef that were pushed onto the slaughter line with front-end loaders of a tractor, because the animals couldn't walk. I mean, that's how, I mean, I'm, I'm here to tell you tonight, Clean up your food supply. If you don't get anything else out of this, clean up your food supply. And then look at the, the next one on there is Guidance for Industry 152. This is like an FDA ruling that says no antibiotics or other drugs should be prohibited in animals until someone proves that the drugs cause mortality. They can cause you to be sick and they can cause epidemics and all these other things. They have to kill you before FDA is going to get let you get rid of it. I mean, this is scandalous, right? And, um, and USDA changed the rules for inspecting chickens, fryers, broilers, and allowed a speed up of line to one chicken every three seconds. Now, how can anybody inspect a chicken in three seconds? Get real. I mean, they have 600 diseases. I mean, that's, that's the way chickens are, right? And so critics maintain that 75% of chickens are diseased. And a consumer's report in 2008 said that 83% of the chickens had salmonella or listeria. Both of those will destroy your kidney, right? And can kill you. So, I mean, that's a big problem. I mean, and so, you know, we have all of these things that FDA and the USDA should be doing and they aren't doing. You know, they're protecting the chemical companies, and they're con protecting the big growers, and they're protecting the drug makers. So in the face of all this poison, you know, the argument we want to make is that organic food is the cheapest food in the marketplace. Not just cheapest, but it's the safest. And a lot of people say, cheapest? Ah, I already have to pay 35% more or 50% more for my grapes or lemons or 
whatever, right? And my argument is like organic food, you only pay for it once, you know? With chemical food, factory farm food, you pay for it at least four times, right? And the first payment is in the marketplace. I call this the down payment, right? The second is at tax time, which is right around the corner, guys. And since 80% of our food is processed and 90% of those ingredients, corn, wheat, cotton, seed, soy, sugar, and rice, get 95% of your subsidies, you know, you're paying for it twice. You're paying for it twice. That's the second price you pay for it. The third payment is to the doctor. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention estimated in 1999 that foodborne illnesses sicken more than 76, 000, 76 million people a year. 300,000 of these people were hospitalized with foodborne illness. More than 6,000 died. More than 10,000 die in the U.S. each year from pesticides and tens of thousands are injured. In California, the most injurious occupation on the farm is working in a cotton gin. And a quarter of those people receive a disabling injury every year. So it's, I mean, it's a seriously out of control food system. The fourth payment will come due when we have to clean up the environment from chemical farming, sloppy use of toxic chemicals. And guess who's gonna pay that? Same people that paid to clean up the banks and Wall Street and the mortgage industry. Us, we're gonna pay for that, right? Because these guys are gonna walk away from it just like they walked away from Bhopal in India. They're not gonna be there to pick up the bill that they created. They don't even wanna fix the infrastructure that they used all these years in this country. So the obvious answer is to regulate factory farming. And regulation, of course, is an old issue in this country. Started out with the North Carolina regulators in the 1760s, right, way before the revolution. They were trying to regulate the aristocrats and big business, right? We're trying to regulate today and nobody wants you to regulate because it's supposed to slow down job creation. You know, it also slows down your life if you don't regulate some of these chemicals, of course. So, um, we have to regulate farming because factory farming emits 50% of our greenhouse gases. We're all worried about fossil fuels, but the elephant in the room is sitting at our dinner tables. You know, we need to vote with our fork to stop climate change. That's the best vote we can make, really. We eat 12 ounces of meat on the average in this country every day. We should cut it to six. If we just cut it to six, you could still get plenty of meat and you'd get rid of 50, the equivalent of 50 million cars on the road just by cutting our meat consumption in half. If we don't fix factory farming, we can't fix, you know, we can't regulate greenhouse gases. And if we don't fix factory farming, we can't fix healthcare because some of our most prominent problems now are food and exercise related, diabetes, you know, obesity, heart disease, cancer, stroke, all of these are food-related diseases that we can fix. So our strategy and the strategy of many other small farmers is to develop a local farm to serve local consumers and nutritious food. We feel that there should be a community organic farm in every community. Carnegie was trying to clean up his image after his uh, partner Frick was shot by the anarchists and so Carnegie, Carnegie created this program where we'd have a library in every community. And we're, Carnegie is responsible for a lot of our libraries. But we don't need to greenwash agriculture to say, well, we need a community farm in every community. We don't need to do it because we did the wrong thing business-wise. We're doing it because that's the right thing. We really need to have farms that are taking care of each other. And those farms should be central places. They should be places of destination. That's what we try to do with our farm. We have festivals and dinners in the field and focus on the kids because how did they fix tobacco? They went after the kids. I really appreciate you having me here. Thanks a lot. <laughs>